Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Yeah, you were uh, talking about empathy, and how did you uh, kind of get interested in empathy? Where did that kind of interest first start? I think that it's always been my approach to uh, handling social problems. I was telling the story, if you want to know where it really started, it just made me think about a story that I was telling at a talk I was giving a few weeks ago about the fact that I grew up in a very racist family in the 1950s in a very segregated city in upstate New York. It was totally segregated, Syracuse. And we had to drive through the black community to go to church on Sunday morning. I mean, my father drove us. And every Sunday, my parents, particularly my mother, would be making terrible comments about those people. They don't even know what a bar of soap looks like. I mean, really ugly, racist comments. And I was just a very little girl. And she was a pretty mean person. She had always been saying really mean things to me and my brothers. And I knew how her meanness affected me. And when she started saying this about these, these black children uh, playing on the streets on Sunday morning, I, I remember thinking, what if they heard her? They would feel as bad as I do when she says mean things to me. I think that's where it started. Um, the next thing that happened was that I was 19 years old. The civil rights movement was starting up in Syracuse. I got involved with a, co a Congress on Racial Equality, and we started doing demonstrations. And that kind of personal connection then got carried into political action for me. Um, and if you, as you know, the, the early 60s were, were, was rabid racism in this country. Um, and it, it, so it, it was a very formative time. And I think those, that early event, which was every Sunday, it wasn't one time. And it was, I felt so humiliated by it. It, it, was, it was like broke my heart to hear these children who are doing nothing other than just playing being talked about in that kind of way. And then connecting that with a political action. And then uh, I was stayed involved in the civil rights movement. The war in Vietnam started. The American left really took force. And the only way that many of us women could deal with the American left was to become feminists because that was as male-dominated as anything was. Where in the civil rights movement, there was a spirit of all of us coming together, a spirit that Martin Luther King embodied, that other activists embodied, and Malcolm X embodied. I mean, it was, it was a spirit of all of us coming together. With the left and the anti-war movement, it was we could make their coffee and type their reports and... No, thank you. And so one had kind of like an empathy part to it, and then the, the left had more of a little authoritarian kind of a... The left it was, you know, yes, turned very authoritarian. And I think, that, I think that that's demographically, it demographically follows. The civil rights movement was spearheaded by African-American people, mostly men, but they understood oppression. They oppressed African-American women, many of them did, but they still understood oppression. And so empathy was, you know, coming close to consciousness for them. I think the more distanced you are from the experience of oppression the, and the more engaged you are in the experience of being the dominating group, the more empathy closes down for you. You don't find a lot of empathy with CEOs or generals, you know. Um, I'm not saying they're absent of it, but Bernie Madoff didn't surprise me at all. 
We know there was just a study came out from UC Berkeley. I don't know if you saw that one where they said that uh, people in the higher state, high, um, in terms in the hierarchy, social hierarchy, they were showing that they actually have less empathy uh, for other people because they don't need to. Because if you're in a lower mm -hmm. state, you need to kind of be aware of what's happening. Exactly. And their explanation I think it. that's what turned me into a soci sociologist. Because I was, uh, I grew up in a very, very poor working class family. My father was a laborer and it was seasonal in New York, upstate New York, and seasonal means long winters that he did, we didn't have income. And, and, and I grew up as a female. And that kind of combination makes you have to be looking around all the time, makes you incredibly observant. I love to observe. And nothing better for me to do than sit in a Starbucks and observe, you know, um, not peeking in on, but observing human behavior and trying to make sense about, out of it in a way that we can understand who we are and how we can improve ourselves. Like the day at the beach at Bodega Bay. I was both caught up in that moment, but also very much observing it. Nothing, I don't, very little passed me by because it was such a poignant moment. And I didn't plan on going home and writing about it. But when I was writing Unmaking War, Remaking Men, at some point I realized I needed to establish a moral base for this book. There is no moral base for the US military or for war. Anything goes. And I don't want to bring, didn't want to bring in, would not bring in, uh, religious values as a moral base. And then it occurred to me that we had it right there in everyday experience of people unwittingly wit witnessing a drowning and how they responded. And we could find our values, our human values, right there. So empathy is the moral base then? Yeah, I think it's more than a moral base. I think it, it, it speaks to the moral base. But I think that empathy is actually an action. It's an engagement. It's how we are. It's not a head thing, as you well know. Um, it's, it's how we are as people. And it comes into how we behave. So when I'm talking to this woman at the beach and asking her what's just happened, because I arrived just as the body bag was being brought up and I didn't see the actual drowning, she's crying profusely. What, she didn't know the man? Was there with her own family? You know, and I started welling up with tears. What, what were we doing? You know, I started thinking about this boy has just lost his father. Oh my God, he's going to feel so guilty for so many years because his father was trying to save him. And, you know, this family has, has this woman has lost a husband and don't know these people at all, but putting oneself... So empathy is, I think, it's always very active. It's always a very active force. Even when we're talking, you know, you ask me a question, I go, yeah, that's a really good question. Or, you know, th we're acknowledging a deeper connection with each other than just, hi, Edwin, I'm Kathy. Distance, disengagement. We're now acknowledging some, some connection. So I think it's right there in, in our being and in our actions, in our interactions all the time. So it's like connection and, and some kind of an action kind of grows out of that? Or... Yeah. And if you look at it from the standpoint of human interaction, all that human interaction really is, is each of us interpreting the meaning of the other. That's what we're doing all day long. Watching television, having this interview, my talking to this group and looking at people's responses and that's making me think I should go this way or that way with what I'm saying. All of that, we're always making interpretations. You know, I'm 
making an interpretation even while I'm talking to you about is this answering the question that he's asking. It's the nature of interaction. It is the reason that we have language. It is the, the, the point of having language so that we can interact. And it's why when people are robbed of language, we go overboard to get language to them, to the blind or uh, to the people who can't hear, to have ways to be able to communicate. What's being done to Bradley Manning with solitary confinement is torture simply because it is depriving him of human interaction. That's, that's not how, it's def how torture is defined, but that's what makes it torture. And so we're interpreting, and all we're doing with empathy is taking that interpretation a level deeper than just, did I answer his question correctly, but is this, you know, serving his purposes? And it, it, he thinks a lot about empathy. What does he, what's he going to come back with? You know, get it, bringing it into feeling as the other feels. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Mary Gordon, who does a program called Roots One. of Empathy. She's and she wonderful. And she says we learn through relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's kind of coming up for me is it's, you're talking about the relationship that people have. And, and relationships are built from interactions. You know, I just saw an old friend from Syracuse, New York, who I haven't seen probably in 40 years. You know, and that little interaction is going to develop into us having coffee and probably staying in contact. And, you know, he's the one who made the statement about the idealism and, you know, they ask the question around that. So interaction leads to relationships. Interaction is what we do in relationships. It's how we understand each other. And, and that's where the empathy is. A long time ago, for my first book, uh, Female Sexual Slavery, I wrote it while Patricia Hurst was um, with the SLA, the Symbionese Liberation Armies. You know, she was kidnapped in Berkeley and held by them. And then there were big shootouts, and then she was arrested uh, as a criminal as opposed to being taken in as a kidnap victim. And I wrote an article about that. I was in graduate school at the time at UC Berkeley in sociology. And I wrote an article, uh, I was trying to write this article about her experience. And this was right after the trial. She was found guilty in the trial of collaborating with the SLA. And I was, I was enraged, but I was about one of the very few who were really angry about it. And so I'm trying to write this article, and I go to class one day, and I was studying with really fabulous sociologist Herbert Bloomer, who uh, worked with George Herbert Mead and, did a, and is, uh, founded the School of Symbolic uh, Interactionism. And that day, he was explaining this thing about interaction that I've just been talking about and how we're interpreting the meaning of the other. And everything is about creating meaning. And while he was talking, I put myself in Patricia Hurst's position in the closet where she was held by the SLA and where she said she was raped by one of the SLA members. And I tried to, to remember everything that I could about the situation that she was in. And then after, she said 40 days, the jurors said probably it was only 20 days, only 20 days locked in a closet. Uh, she was brought out before the head of the SLA and he said, you're going, we're going to let you go. You are free to leave or you can join with us. And I said to myself, if I was in that situation, would I believe a word of this? It's all you have to do to know 
that she was enslaved. What I believe the word, a word of this man who is a criminal, who has killed all kinds of people, who has overseen my captivity for 40 days in a closet and my kidnapping, would I believe that he's now just going to let me go free? Or that if I say I want to go free, I'm going to walk away and be shot in the back? So you put yourself in uh, her shoes kind of imaginatively. And, uh... and then I wrote the article and finished the article from that point of view. Sometime later, it was published immediately in a feminist journal, and uh, some months later I got a call from one of her sisters who said that she, Patricia was back in prison. She had been out on parole. She was back in prison, and her sister said that she wanted to, um, that Patricia wanted to meet with me. So I went to the prison on the day appointed and through all the to get in and I went in and there's a lot of people around the table that she was sitting at but I immediately recognized her from the photographs and I went over to her and I said Patricia excuse me um, I just wanted to introduce myself and let you know that I'm here I'm Kathleen Barry and she pushes the person in the chair next to her away say excuse me this person has to sit down here and the first thing she said to me is how did you know you're the only one who got it right. It was, that was it. It was, that was the empathy, that was the engagement in that kind of interaction. And it was just, that's when I really, I knew what my course was in sociology that day in Herbert Bloomer's uh, graduate seminar, is he's laying this out and I'm just using what he's doing to try to understand what I couldn't get through. I couldn't make a breakthrough in this article. I went home and finished it that afternoon. So that was like another milestone in your kind of learning about yeah. uh, empathy. So you're kind of put yourself into her shoes. And I know you've been quite uh, critical about uh, George Bush calling him a psychopath and so forth. Could you, would you be able to put yourself in his shoes like you did with her? Is as much as I can put myself in any psychopath's shoes. Um, and, <laughs> and I don't, it, this, isn't, this is a pretty studied um, I don't know if you've seen this chapter in my book, but it's a pretty studied approach to his psychopathy. It, it looks at very closely at the deliberate misrepresentations that he made, the humor that he engaged in about the weapons of mass destruction. Well, thousands upon thousands of Afghan or Iraqis were being killed. Um, it's... I go into the, well, and at any rate, that's not your question. Your question is would I be able to put myself in his, his position. I find it difficult because we as human beings have a natural repugnance toward sociopaths and, and psychopaths. I mean, it's, it's just something that you see coming up and you find people, therapists, talking about it was, well, of course you felt sick to your stomach. That person is a sociopath. No wonder, that's why you felt that way. There is a repugnance around that. So I certainly feel that repugnance. At the same time, when he was being interviewed on his latest book, I followed a couple of the interviews looking for any moment when he could take the position of the other. And he failed miserably. Uh, Oprah Winfrey gave him a perfect opportunity when, she, when he was saying that about how being called a racist was the worst. That was when he was called a racist by Kanye West, that was the worst moment of his presidency. Not all the deaths in Iraq, uh, not all the deaths of American soldiers, but being called a racist because he's sure he wasn't. And Oprah said to him, but couldn't you see how some people, couldn't you kind of put yourself in some people's shoes, African Americans, and see how with Katrina 
and you know these other things people might come up with that absolutely not he said I was just wanting some some place to connect because I think to have to be empathetic I can have interaction I can interpret his meanings but to be empathetic you have to have connection there. And he closes it off. Cindy, uh... If you had a metaphor for empathy, what would empathy be like? Like, empathy is often seen as the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. If you created your own metaphor... Uh, I, I would put feeling, the word feeling in there. Feeling and interpreting the meaning interpreting the meaning of experience with the feeling of the experience for the other, of the other. That's what I would put in. And I think I don't have anything more to say on George W. Bush. <laughs> okay, let's end it there then. Great, thanks. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.